Howdy, we're back again with chapter two, which is the scientific methods in psychology, something uh, near and dear to my heart as I teach a research methods class every semester here at Cal State Long Beach, and I've taught that since my first assistantship job uh, in graduate school back at Tulane. Uh, so we're going to go through some of the concepts here. Uh, first of all, of course, that psychology is a science, right? It's a, it's a deliberate attempt to quantify and measure something that's largely uh, inquantifiable. Uh, so that's kind of cool when you think about it. And we do this by applying some of the natural science sort of tools for empiricism. Uh, empiricism being that sort of uh, observable evidence that we look for. And we try to do this, of course, with a, a grounded set of rules and ethics that uh, we try to abide by in terms of our human participants especially, but also those animal participants uh, in terms of you know limiting the use of those and having very justifiable reasons to use animals at all. Um, and when we use humans, of course, uh, how invasive we can be with those procedures and what exactly we should and could be doing with humans um, that's not uh, uh, hindering their, you know, uh, progression for the rest of their lives, which some of the, you know, earlier studies in psychology uh, may have overlooked and we learned our lesson, luckily. You know, the basic concept of research is uh, the scientific method, right? Asking a question, uh, coming up with some predictable hypothesis and collecting evidence that either confirms or disconfirms that, right? Uh, but that empirical evidence is key in that process to uh, rule out, you know, uh, things that aren't true and, you know, kind of support things that are true or seem to be true. Um, we're talking about gravity in a second. So, you know, evidence has been built up over the years that gravity is, uh, is pretty much true, but uh, there are potentially... Uh, uh, conspiracy theorists out there maybe that are still doubting, you know, uh, gravity, just as some people maybe uh, doubt climate change or other issues uh, going on in the world of physics and other sciences. And psychology, some people doubt it even more because it's harder to quantify. You know, so that empirical evidence I talked about is so important. There's, there's things that we can see and, you know, quantify and count and then compare across people. Uh, Doing that is uh, using something like an operational definition, some um, way of observing or measuring what we're looking at. So that could be a score on a personality measure, or that can be the number of times someone clicks their pen as maybe a, a operational definition of anxiety in a certain situation. Uh, you know, when we do this research, we have theories and we have hypotheses that are derived from those theories. So if we think that pen clicking is a, a sign of it, uh, anxiety, we may uh, have some theory that explains that, you know, maybe uh, uh, something about biology, about activation, or uh, maybe about social learning, about watching other people fidget, uh, or something else that sort of leads us to believe that uh, more anxious people will click their pen more, right? So that's our prediction, our hypothesis. It doesn't have to be super complicated, it just has to be a, a, a guess, right? A best guess based on what you've read and learned so far. And then, of course, the more support we have, the more difference between uh, anxious and unanxious people in terms of the number of clicks they have, that that operational definition, uh, then we have more support and more confidence in that idea that they're related. You know, in that process, one of the things that, you know, we talk about in terms of ethics, but also just in terms of generalizing or making sure our results generalize or mean something to us, the population, is the idea of our samples that we use to test these hypotheses and to apply these theories. You know, if it's not representative uh, of the total group we hope to make assumptions about, then it's sort of not great research. We want to get a diversity of participants if diversity is who we're looking to generalize to. Otherwise, we may want to use a very homogenous group at times if it's something maybe um, within a, a cultural group or gender group or otherwise. Um, deciphering how maybe different types of men or different types of women uh, deal with maybe stress or anxiety, for example. Anyways, there's different types of samples we use. Uh, the not worst, but not great, is a convenient sample, which is whoever you can find, right? Um, representative, you know, is kind of looking to see uh, who you're who you're going to generalize to, as I said. Uh, so you're you're going towards that as a goal, and you want that to be as random as possible, right? So everyone uh, in a community or out there in the world has an equal chance, theoretically, of being in your study or in your survey. And we want that to be cross-culturally valid, so sometimes we use cross-cultural samples, you know, looking at people from different ethnic groups, 
or maybe different uh, socioeconomic statuses. All sorts of things could contribute to your cultural identification. And, you know, looking across those uh, groupings might be a question in and of itself. Based on, you know, the, the quality of that sample and who we look at, of course, uh, replications may be more or less important, right? Um, so in some cases, when we look to test a hypothesis, uh, you know, we use who we can find or the best sample we can get, uh, but you want to replicate that and make sure that the, the findings you have are not just maybe cross-culturally val valid, but, you know, valid at different age groups and all sorts of different considerations that may be important. You know, motivations for jobs, for example, in my field, maybe were quite different with uh, previous generations than, you know, the generations now who may be looking at different types of work. So I think that's important to consider. Meta-analysis takes this up a level by saying, let's combine every study that's ever been done on a topic. Of course, in that case, studies have had to have been done. Um, but in that case, you combine them all and create sort of an average. So a meta-analysis is not a study in and of itself using real participants or real animals. It's a study of studies, looking at uh, sort of the overall um, sort of pattern of results that we see. Uh, so that's important. But taking a step back a little bit, most research you know, we're looking at some sort of a trend, right? Um, we're looking at something that's going on, and in that way we want to, you know, look at some change, usually called the outcome, right? And so we measure that change in a certain way, and we look to see whether what we see in terms of the change is impressive, and by impressive we mean statistically impressive, you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt or beyond random chance, if you will, uh, that those, those results come out, right? Um, if they don't, or if they do, uh, it's an issue of whether or not it's falsifiable, right? Um, in a lot of cases, we get support for our hypotheses, but that shouldn't always be the case, right? There should be uh, situations where um, you can find evidence against it if it's not true. Uh, the example I like is the motorcycle mechanic honking the horn of a motorcycle to see if the battery's dead. If the battery's dead, the horn will not honk, so that hypothesis could be falsified, right? Um, so a good theory is one that, you know, uh, is falsifiable, uh, just like gravity, right? Even though it hasn't been falsified yet, uh, we've done tests to, to sort of test out that rate of gravity and even know the speed of gravity. It's like three point something something to the something something power, right? Um, you can Google that. So the burden of proof is really uh, on the evidence, right? If you don't gather evidence to support your claim, then you can't have any confidence that your hypothesis or theory has any support. There are articles that are just theoretical arguments, but in the end you have to supply evidence to support that, right? And usually that theory uh, is what we say is uh, ideally parsimonious. Um, you know, the simpler the better in terms of explaining what's going on. Uh, there's statistical techniques now where we can use a lot of different um, variables and create a lot of different associations all at the same time called structural equation modeling. Um, but that sort of is the, uh, the opposite almost of parsimony. It's, it's the most explanatory power, um, but it's sometimes hard to digest. We use a couple of different stats it's important to go over uh, to identify sort of change and to look at the support we have for these theories and hypotheses. You know, the descriptive statistics and the inferential. Uh, the descriptive statistics, first of all, are just describing the data, right? So whatever method we use, uh, you know, survey, naturalistic, clinical, correlational, um, you know, looking at a pattern uh, in terms of what's the, the overall rate what's the, um, you know, high versus low. If you think about sort of the, the graphs that are reported there, looking at temperature maybe, um, you know, that's a descriptive sort of relationship. You know, the, the more uh, complicated you get, moving from something like correlations, which is just looking at, you know, associations between variables, uh, to something more complicated, you might be going from descriptive to inferential. Uh, inferential, what we're talking about in a second, being that uh, beyond chance or um, probability that your results are, are impressive enough to not be uh, random or by chance. Correlations can be positive or negative, that's what's being displayed there. Uh, you know, the higher on the variable one, the higher on variable two would be a positive correlation. The other one is a negative correlation. They can both be significant. Uh, no correlation would be a zero, which is you know, the lack of relationship.
Another illustration of this is the scatter plot you can see here. The scatter plot is really the dots. The line is sort of a best fitting line, uh, uh, which can be quantified as a number like 0.45. And that 0.45 is sort of the, the strength or the closeness of association between those X and Y things. In this case, fish consumption and depression. Uh, you see Japan has the highest fish consumption and the lowest depression. Um, and that's why that uh, is at the bottom right, whereas New Zealand is the lowest fish construct, uh, consumption and the highest depression. Uh, and, you know, there's a pretty close association there between those two variables, so that's why it's a 0 0.8, which is a very high correlation. Uh, in this case, they're making the argument this is an illusory correlation uh, or an association that really means nothing. Uh, we just happen to find there. Although I might argue that more fish, more happy. Anyways, inferential statistics are the other side of the coin where we're looking at that probability, right? That statistical significance. Uh, in some cases, P less than 0.05 is the benchmark, being one in 20 or a 5% chance that you find the results you do uh, by chance alone, right? And so in this case, the lower the P value, the uh, lower the probability that these differences you see uh, or these correlations you see would just be that illusory or random sort of uh, correlation. Um, in formal experiments, it's comparing means, right? So in this case, nonviolent versus violent films leading to later forms of aggression. Maybe that aggression was, uh, um, you know, how many times you say you would steal from a friend on a mock survey uh, after you watch a violent film. Uh, maybe how many times you... Uh, um, tap your pencil or something, that could potentially be a, a operationalization of aggression. Uh, so in formal experiments, we do something where we um, separate people, show them maybe different films, and then measure that dependent variable to see if that IV or that film type had an effect on the DV or the aggression. But, you know, there's a lot of different types of studies. Uh, the comparison or the uh, the commonalities here are really the variables. We have independent and dependent variables in a lot of different types of studies. You know, the independent variable being the cause and the dependent being the effect. Experimental groups tend to be uh, those that have the, uh, the drug or the uh, experimental condition. So think of that as a getting the drug versus not getting the drug. The not getting the drug is the control group, right? Uh, in a lot of cases, we want to control for people being a part of a study. So if you give them a placebo or something that feels like the experimental condition, then they still feel like they're getting something. That's the sort of sugar pill idea in the uh, medical sciences. Anyways, uh, in my violent film example, the violent film, as you see there, uh, they get a violent film. The nonviolent film could be the control condition, let's say. And you're really looking to see the effect of violence on some dependent variable. So when we describe all this, we use those descriptive statistics, like I mentioned with the descriptive studies, looking at means and medians and modes, um, hopefully following what we call a normal distribution, where it sort of, you know, focuses around the mean. So for depression, for example, or aggression or anything like that, there's sort of a, a median level or a mean level, uh, mean being the average, median being the middle score, and mode being the most frequent score. We also look at things like standard deviations to see how spread out those scores are. You know, we tend to need some sort of variability, and the science's variability is good because it, you know, shows that we have high and low. If you only have low scores, then it's hard to decipher a difference there. You're not getting maybe a representative sample. Anyways, ethics are one of the last things we need to discuss and very important. Um, we try to give people informed consent when they participate in a study, so that's telling them what's going to happen. We try to limit how much we deceive them and then let them know if they were deceived what actually happened. That's the debriefing, right? And we try to make sure everything's confidential in the process, uh, if not anonymous, if possible. In online surveys now, we even mask the IP address of the survey uh, taker so we don't know what computer they took the survey from. Um, but we tend to still say it's confidential, uh, even though uh, most of it's anonymous nowadays. You know, some of the reasons we do this are to protect people, um, but we also need to know how different people uh, react to research and, you know, what their emotions and things are too. We need to represent everybody in our research. So funding agencies now won't even, uh, uh, you know, fund protocols if they don't have representation. Um, so that's important. We want to know about everybody, and so we shouldn't let research happen that doesn't uh, include everybody. 
Anyways, hope this made sense and see you next week.